We stopped believing that source or the source of all things was present or would meet our needs in ways that were essential. And when you do that, you start hoarding your food or you build a wall up to keep your neighbors out from getting yours. And then you pick up a rock and then you pick up a gun and then you pick up a bomb to ensure you're going to get what you're supposed to have or you think you're supposed to have. And the guides say, you know, these things are our creations. We created walls and borders. We created all these things. These are our creations. Beautiful. Welcome to my podcast. I'm Guy, of course, and today I am rejoined by Paul Selig. If you're unfamiliar with Paul, he is a psychic and a channeler, and this conversation did not disappoint today. In fact, it's probably my favorite one out of the three that I've had with Paul. Uh, we certainly connected um, pretty deep today, and, and it was great to see where this conversation organically went. He does actually end up channeling spontaneously halfway through the podcast as well, so be sure to keep an eye out on that. Um, I'm going to keep this intro brief. Hopefully, I'll get to meet you in person someday, somewhere. If you do come to one of our retreats or events and you listen to the podcast, please be sure to come up, give me a hug, and say hello. I'm definitely a hugger. <laughs> and here's to a fantastic 2024. Who knows when you're listening to this, but um, yeah. Anyway, let's go over to Paul, enjoy, and be sure to let me know in the comments below if you are watching this on YouTube about the conversation. Much love. See you soon. Beautiful. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here. Thank you. I uh, I like to ask everyone on the show, and I, I thought we might as well start here because it's been, like we spoke off air, nearly five years since we last um came together on a podcast like this. Um, but if a complete stranger sat next to you in a cafe or a restaurant and asked you what you did for a living, how would you reply? You know, I would probably say I write and I teach, but that was what I said for 25 years when I was a college teacher. And even though the books that come through me are, are channeled, um, I can say I'm a writer and people can understand that. And if they ask what I teach, then I can get into the strangeness of all of this. But I, I don't lead with it, and I'm not comfortable introducing myself like, hi, I'm Paul, I'm a psychic in a channel, because then you have to explain all that stuff. And, um, and it's not that I mind doing that, but it's often not the conversation somebody wants to have. Yeah, of course. And, and I am curious, because I was looking through your website before we got online, and I was like, wow, you... You've been in the media a lot. Like, there's a lot of, uh, uh, it seems that way that you're attracting a lot of people. And I'm wondering, how does that feel? How do you sit with that? Because you strike me as somebody that is quite personal and, yeah. and introvert, but at the same time, yeah. you've got these big messages that are coming through. <laughs> the work is the work, and the work comes through me. And I, I think of myself in many ways as a radio for a broadcast. So the radio itself isn't that interesting necessarily or glamorous. And the broadcast of the radio changes. If I'm channeling, I'm hearing the guides. If I'm working psychically, I'm tuning into the people that are asking for questions about their lives. So I'm, I'm not tremendously comfortable with attention. You know, I, because I taught college for a long time, I got comfortable sitting in front of people and being able to hold a space. And that was very, very useful. Um, but I, you know, I don't seek it out. I, I live in the rainforest now. I'm, I'm off the beaten track, you know, and I, I quite like it that way. Yeah. Wow. So I guess lead, leading in from that then, which I'm curious because we spoke, um, and we'll get into the, 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 the I believe it's the 11th book that is, 11th that is book out, is out. Yeah. Yeah. And that blows my mind too. There's, yeah. there's a, that, when we last spoke, it actually wasn't even COVID hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. And I'm always curious as well, just as in your personal life, how do you, how has it been these last five years? How do you deal with the challenges? Because it's, I, I do wonder sometimes if it's easy to, people from the outside looking in saying, well, he's channeling all this wisdom. He, he must 
have his life in the bag and, and off he goes, you know, and just applies it. But it's not in the bag. I don't know what that looks like. You know, I don't know that I would want that, but my life has changed incredibly in the last five years, really beyond my ideas of what could be. And I'm very grateful for that. I, the guides have been talking about sort of the shifts that we would be going through since they began dictating books through me. And that was in 2009. The first book was dictated. I don't write the books. I speak them, you know, and then they're, they're, tra- they're the recordings are transcribed and there's no editing. So at a certain level, I've been prepared for the magnitude of some of the changes as we all have been, I think, if we're really sort of listening to, to the cosmos. But, you know, I was, um, you know, channeling book after book and I was channeling a book called, um, alchemy, which was kicking up every piece of dust I had hidden in myself. And it was a very, very hard passage for me and um i was channeling in costa rica that book had been finished and uh, new york city shut down during covid while i was in costa rica and i couldn't go back home to new york my dog was there my stuff was there i was moving apartments the following week um and i wound up on maui out of a friend said i have a place for you to stay and found me a little tiny house and stocked it with Costco lasagna and i went to Maui and lived in a tiny house. And I thought I would stay there for a month or two until this whole COVID thing blew over. And I ended up not leaving, really not leaving. I stayed. I ended up buying my first home, you know, and things I never thought I would do. And my life has changed in remarkable ways. And the books have continued. They actually just finished dictation on their 12th book. And that'll be out in the fall. And they're saying that's the last of the series of books that began with I Am the Word, maybe 12, 13 years ago. And they're going to do, I'll write my own story now. And then they say they have more to talk about. They have more books, but I don't know what they're about or what they're on. I mean, they're, they're channeling up a storm these days because the world is in such a challenging place. And they seem to have a lot to say. But I am living a very different life than I could have imagined. It's a much gentler life. I have community here. Um, I, I live in the rainforest. I don't even know how to drive yet. I failed my driving test three times so far. People have to get me to the grocery store. You know, I mean, I'm just, you know, and, and oddly, it's all worked in some kind of remarkable way. So. You know, I'm, 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 I've been through a lot as we all have and great change, great, 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 great change. But, you know, when you're kind of having to ride a wave of change, you really kind of have to ride it. You really can't hold on to the old. And in my case, most of the old is just gone. You know, who I thought I was, who I thought I was supposed to be, what I thought I was supposed to look like the life I thought I was supposed to have, many of those things are gone. You know, I taught at NYU for 25 years. You know, I left everything, you know, and this is my life now, and I'm glad for it. That's a big deal. And it's a big, you say it's okay, you know, the fact that you couldn't return home and then, and you've just gone to Hawaii. I mean, did, did you find from the the teachings that are coming through your guides that it allowed you to embrace that more as opposed to resist it or was well i you know it's really funny the the friend that invited me to to maui to stay was somebody that i met and the first time i met him the guide said out of the blue you need to trust him and i never forgot that and we became good friends over the years and we're very different people you know And he'd been trying to get me to come visit, you know, um, him and his family for a while. And I'd been to Hawaii once on a terrible blind date with a, with a a dolphin, a Spanish dolphin communicator. It was really a bad date for both of us, I think. And I said, I will never go back to Hawaii as long as I live. So I kept ignoring the invitations to, to, to Maui. And then when I came here, I felt calm in a way that I hadn't felt. And maybe because there was such an enormous world event happening that I couldn't do anything about, 
I couldn't move my stuff into the new apartment. I couldn't walk my dog. I just had to trust that these things would be taken care of. And in fact, they were. And my life began to sort of play to a sort of different melody. That's the only way I can describe it. And in a lot of ways, I think the work did prepare me for this. You know, the friend that invited me here, I met through the work. And Maui, I think, has long been a, a place that supports people who are sort of, I don't like, I don't like the word seeking, you know, but sort of practicing or, or abiding in an awareness of spirit. So, you know, I live down the road pretty much from the Ram Dass Satsang, the community there, and they welcome me and I have friends and, you know, people to see. And my dog yeah. is here and the few things that I took from New York are here. And I live in the rainforest and I can look out the window and see the ocean in the distance. It, it couldn't be more nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing all that. I feel sure. I feel a lot of people will relate can re resonate with that, you know, and I, I, I mean, I, I'm in front of hundreds of people each month now, Paul, here mm -hmm. in Australia. Right. And I find it fascinating that there's, there's a part of us that we all want to be able to surrender. We all want to trust yeah. more and, and, and lean into that. But the, the world projects such a different image of what I guess sometimes is within the human spirit. But yeah. Well, I mean, I let go because I couldn't control you know, I had just rented my dream apartment in Manhattan. I never spent a night there, not one night. My stuff was there. My assistant lived there for free for 10 months. He had a great time, you know, took care of the dog some. It was, it was great. But, you know, it was a chapter, and I was living in a tiny house, basically a tiny, tiny place when I first got there, you know, and I couldn't have been happier with that. So I, I in, from, in my case, Surrenders never come easily, ever, ever, ever. But when it's happened, I think it's generally been followed by grace and some sense, at least in this case for me, that things would unfold as they needed to because I had radical trust. That's all I had at that time. And it did in really serendipitous and, and kind of miraculous ways. So I don't think I've got it all sewn up and figured out. But I'm, I'm struggling less on the journey than I think I used to. And I'm not nearly as invested in things being difficult, which I think I was highly invested in for some reason. I guess I thought that was noble or it had always been hard. So I assumed it must always be hard. And I don't feel that anymore. I think stuff happens to us individually, to us collectively. And they have to be seen as opportunities in order for us to, to move through them with some kind of awareness. And, and I will say again, grace. And at times when it's especially hard, I think it's especially useful to do that. Yeah, yeah beautiful. So you're on to your 11th book, which is yeah. quite amazing. The book, uh, the, yeah, the book of innocence. I just want uh -huh. to make sure. And, do you feel through the 11 books up to this point, there's, there's been a change in direction from the message that are coming through, or is it just one led from the next? The guides have said this, and I didn't understand this for a long time. You know, I was surprised when they first said there was going to be three books, and then another three, and another three, and another three. So there's just a series of 12. Um, but the books, they say, operate... Each book is sort of an energetic attunement that works directly with the reader. The books are sort of vibrational experiences. I mean, the guides say that they're supporting the students who are working with their material. You know, they're helping them, you know, in their, in their, in their understanding. But the work is very experiential and often for people energetically palpable, which I like. But I think that the very first book, which was called I Am the Word, in some ways may be the primer or the template that they've been unpacking with greater and greater detail and depth since that time. They're talking now about how a world is made new through consciousness, how the material realm is altered through a higher level of vibrational accord that we can and will align to. And they 
talked about the these ideas in sort of sweeping ways, I think, at the end of the very first volume. And I think they've caught up to where they wanted to get to. But if you think of each book maybe as a note, you know, and I think of the attunements this way, or they've explained the attunements, the energetic attunements, which are spoken. You can call them incantations or prayers, but they're decrees of truth, claims of truth, they say. Each um, attunement operates as a note on a piano. And when all of the notes are played in simultaneity, you have a chord, a vibrational chord, and they'll say A-C-C-O-R-D or A-C-H-O-R-D is on a piano. And what they've often said that they're doing with their work is that they're transposing the music that we are, the vibrational field that we are, how we're comprised, because they say we've been operating in this collective reality that they call an octave with its high and low notes. But they say there's another octave that exists simultaneously. And they're sort of, I guess, transposing us to be able to be played, the true self, the divine self, be played or expressed in this higher way. And I think that's been the mission of the books from the beginning. And I do think it's been unpacking and, and a gradual escalation. So just leaning on that metaphor you just used then, are we as a culture, a society, as human beings, move into the next octave? Is yeah. that what is happening? They say so, yeah. That we, you know, that they've they've said it a number of times, too many times now, but I have to trust it. But they say, you know, humanity has decided collectively, the collective soul of the species that we are, we we have decided to move forward. And part of it's because we can't go on the way we have been without annihilating ourselves, which we have the choice to do if we want to. They say, if you want to learn the futility of war. By finding no one left standing, you can learn the lesson that way, but you don't have to. So they do say that there is a collective shift happening and that what's going on now in a lot of ways, I can't say that it's the resistance to, to the shift, but I can say that they've said, and they said this in a book called The Book of Truth, which was dictated maybe five years ago before, or before the, 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 the U.S. election between you know, Trump and Clinton. Right before that, they laid out this book, and they said, everything that has been hidden is about to come to the surface. And imagine that your backyard is an archaeological dig, and what was buried five years ago is going to come to the surface, and 5,000 years is going to come to the surface. And the purpose isn't to point fingers and to make people wrong, which is what we all like to do and blame, because that doesn't get us much of anywhere. But they say it's because nothing is transformed until it's first seen. And that we're having to see now. And if we're having to see, you know, what we do to each other in the name of whatever, religion or ethnicity or commerce or bigotry or whatever it might be, how we treat each other is really what we're living with. And I think that what the guides say is when you can understand they say, you know, the only real problem humanity faces, the only real one is what they call the denial of the divine, saying God is not or cannot be. And the teachings they bring through are really about claiming what they call the inherent divine, where it has been most denied. And that includes in ourselves. The God will call it the God within. I'm not saying I know how to do this all the time. I think I'm better with it than I used to be. And I trust them enough at this point because I don't know why they would be so committedly resolute in the ongoing nature of the teaching. There are people that really study these books. I'm not one of them. I, the, only, the first time I read these books cover to cover is when I have to sit down and do the audio book. I'm so busy taking it. I used to transcribe them. It just drove me crazy listening to my own voice. For so it took longer to transcribe than to channel. The first book took two weeks. I think the last book that was just dictated um, and finished in, in September, I think took maybe 22 days, 30 days, the most of dictation. 
But when I have to sit down and do the audio book, I sit down with the transcripts and I have to read. And that's the first time I go, oh, my God, this makes sense. Or, oh, my God, this is really clear or it's not repetitious with the other texts. It's the next step forward. And so that's how it's been. I don't know what the, the original question was, but I, I think I, I did a sideways answer on it. No, there's, there's a lot there. You're triggering a lot of questions in me. And just on a side note, before I, I want to get into a little bit more about what you just shared, um, do you recall when you channel, do you actually recall the words and take it on board? Or is it more? A third. Okay. I'm going so fast. I don't, you see, I, I you know, when I channel, I, most of the time, I whisper the words and repeat. That's this, it's a clumsy, inelegant. I'm not very fashionable and graceful when I'm chanting. I mean, it's just whisper, repeat, whisper, repeat. It drives people crazy sometimes. Once in a while, nowadays, it comes through fully direct, and then I don't recall any of it. It's just I know that I'm making a lot of sound, but I don't track it. The way it comes through now, if you can imagine reading. Ticker tape or fortune, like I sometimes I was like reading a thousand fortune cookies, one after the other, after the other. And I just read what's on each little slip of paper. And the next slip of paper comes, the next phrase, the next phrase, the next phrase. And it's only when it's all put together that you go, my God, this is really interesting and coherent and smart. In any book, maybe, well, certainly the last ones, the first ones that I was transcribing, I probably had typos, but now people go through these things like crazy is two transcription is somebody proofreading it, then the editors, and then I'm reading it. It's just nuts, you know, just to look at the language. And in any book that I recall for the last six years or so, maybe three words are corrected because mostly because I mispronounced it or I was talking so fast that I dropped an and or a the, you know, because it's presumed when you listen to the sentence structure, but that's about it. Yeah. But mostly I remember about a third of a lecture. And, um, and it's not an, unless I read the lecture, which I don't usually do, do I understand the full content and full meaning? Yeah, fair enough. Um, well, I remember you spoke about the recognizing the God within us, the divine within us, the realization yeah. of the divine. And I feel for many people, including on my own journey, I, I had no really concept of that i wasn't brought up in any religious kind of teachings or anything and it was just a void there was there was yeah, there was really. nothing there and how would you describe that to people because un unless i've got um you know very uh biased lenses on that i feel mm. more and more people are leaning into this exploration yeah now well i was raised sort of an atheist you know, and it's only when I hit a real point of crisis in my life when I was 25 that I began to pray. And I only did that because I was staying in a hotel. I couldn't find drugs in the state I was in. And the, the Gideon sleeve, these little Bibles in American hotel rooms. And I took it out. It said prayer for people in crisis. I thought, okay. I mean, I didn't even know what the crisis was, but I knew I was in one. I said it and I meant it. And then I forgot about it. And that might have been the key. I said it, I meant it, and I forgot about it. And three days later, I was back in New York, and I woke up after a rough night, and I asked myself what I could do that was positive that day. It's been a rough night. I think I spent my last dollar. And I heard a voice telling me what to do, and I did it. And then everything changed, and that was the beginning of a path. When I say I heard a voice, it wasn't a voice in the room. It's, a, it's as it is now. It's like a thought that you cannot refute, that just is true, and you can't pretend you didn't hear it. And that's clear audience and their cognizance for me. When I hear, it's like the guide's voice comes through and the other thoughts recede, you know, and you can't really debate. I, I do interrupt the guide's teachings all the time and ask questions because if I don't understand it, I, I, want, I want some clarity. But the process of opening up to spirit, the first thing you see I needed to know was that it was possible. And I grew up in a family where we didn't believe in anything. Both of my parents were completely disenfranchised by religion for hard reasons in their, in their childhoods. 
And my mom used to like to say we were agnostic, but, you know, we used to snicker at people who believed in things. And maybe you'd go to a Christmas mass because the, the choir was pretty, but you didn't celebrate anything, nothing at all. So I got permission at age 25 to believe that maybe there was something more. And then I asked it. I thought, well, if there is a God and I was beginning to think there might be, and you asked to be woken up, why would it want to say no? And I had a bit of an experience of energy after that, which may have been me hyperventilating, but it was palpable. But, you know, I studied a form of energy healing in my early 30s. I went to an energy healer first because I was seeing lights around people. I didn't know what the hell was going on. And I was my life was falling apart. I was a year out of graduate school. I had no money. I couldn't think straight. I was, you know, I, I was really about a step from homelessness when I look back at that time. And I'm shocked that I made it as well as I did and that I was as cared for as well as I was. But I think I stayed willing to the possibility. And I think that that's all. That opens the door. And that was enough for me. And I think it's enough for most people if you're willing. You know, most of the time we pray, like, give me what I want. And it's rarely thy will or whatever God is, its will be done. Because I just can't figure it out anymore. And I can't make this go away. And I can't solve this through my own force of will. And that's, I think, when we make the allowance. You know, I understand from my guides that we have free will. It's sacred. And if we want to use it to say, okay, I'm willing, that is a use of will. And then we can be met there. But I don't think spirit necessarily overrides us. I think we get to make the choice. You know, we get to offer ourselves in some way or another to to this mm. and i you know i i'm not an awakened being and i'm not a spiritual teacher and i'm not a guru and i'm this guy that complains about you know being single and you know the vet bill and all the stuff that people like to complain about but i do live in a world that is informed by something more that i can't necessarily define or explain and I've been given more proof than a lot of people, and I still have my questions. You know, I, I wouldn't dare to be so snug to say that I have the answers, and I don't have the answers for anybody. You know, I just have some quirky abilities that seem to be of help. Well, they certainly are, <laughs> that's for sure. So, when you say, it would, I'm curious about innocence as well. Why yeah. is the book? Innocence. I wasn't expecting that because they've been doing all these lectures on presence and being. And I was sure that was going to be the title of the book when I heard there's another book. And then they said, and welcome to the book of innocence, because that's how I hear the titles in the middle of a lecture. I was in front of like 200 people in Berkeley and they were doing, and they started the book in front of them. And it's like, you know, okay. Because the aspect of us that is the divine self or the true self, or the, they call it the monad, they, sometimes they call it the indwelling Christ or the divine spark. It doesn't really matter what you call it, I don't think. That part of us is not entrained in what they call the common field. The common field being the reality that we've been indoctrinated in, which is more than an idea of linearity and time. Um, and is comprised in some ways as a museum or legacy to the ideas of those who've come before us. So the guides sometimes say, look in the room, look at the room you're in. Everything around you was named by somebody who showed up before you. And it's an inherited structure. So the personality self, which we all have, and there's nothing wrong with it, or the small self. The guides have said knows itself entirely through history, through situation, through experience learned or inherited. So this is when you cross the street if you don't want to get hit by the bus, and this is what you wear when you're on a date, and this is what it means to be successful, or a man or a woman, or the, you know, all the stuff, all the rules of a world, what's important, what's of value, what's beautiful, who's beautiful, what we should aspire to, all those shoulds are moored in a common field. And that divine self expresses beyond all those things because it's not tainted 
with this false lens or bad prescription lens that is born in a belief that we're separate from our source. That God say, every memory you have and everybody has is faulty, is a faulty memory because you are perceiving everything through a lens of separation when in fact that's not true. And so when you align to the aspect of self that is innocent, which is already operating in an awareness of its connection with source, and you allow this part of you to reclaim the aspects of you and the memory that has been operating in distortion, you move to another level of perception and awareness where you're not replicating the old because that's what you were taught to do. So it's a crazy teaching. And the idea of reclaiming memory, personal memory and collective memory in a higher way, it's not about whitewashing the past. It's not pretending that the U.S. didn't have a slave trade or that this didn't happen. It's not none, 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 none of that. But it's re-seeing or re-comprehending all of these things beyond the meanings that they've been given to a level of truth, which is must operate with the presence of the divine. So that's how things are altered and changed, they say, through the re-seeing or the re-knowing of source where source was denied. And if you look at any act of atrocity in the world, personal or collective, they say it's born in a denial of the divine. You know, and they talk about this stuff pretty directly. So I think what they're doing is giving us permission to to claim a new world. You know, I mean, that's my, I mean, did I get that right now? They just said not really. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to them for a second, even though I haven't done this. So, you know, I don't know what they're going to say. We have one thing to say. We have one thing to say. The aspect of it, the aspect of you that is innocence is already innocent, is already in a united state with the source of all things, with the source of all things. It's expression as you, it's expression as you is what claims the world, is what claims the world anew. Any bias you may hold, any bias you may hold as to what things should mean, as to what things should mean must be reclaimed, must be reclaimed and reseen and reseen from a higher purview, from a higher purview without distortion, without the distortion that separation claims, that separation claims and demands for all of you and demands for all of you. If there is no God, if there is no God, why not kill everyone? Why not kill everyone? We know the one beside you is holy. When you know the one beside you is holy, why would you injure him or her? Why would you injure him or her? Why would you denounce him or her? Why would you denounce him or her? You would offer them love. You would offer them love because God is love, because God as love knows itself and loves, knows itself in love through all it experiences, through all it experiences. When you understand the aspect of you, when you understand the aspect of you that knows who it is, that knows who it is, knows who others are as well, knows who others are as well, you will live a very different life, a very different life than you believe you can, than you believe you can, than you believe you can, correct? That's what I hear. Wow. Did they... Did you feel a presence wanting to come in then to collect? Well, I asked, you know, they're okay. all, you know, I asked when I, you know, if I say, you know, that's how it works. They don't, I don't, I don't know that I ever really get interrupted, but if I'm thinking, should I do this? And I might hear not wise, but I've asked the question of myself and I might get the answer. Not wise. Like don't stick your foot in your mouth now. Maybe do, do it tomorrow if you want to. So for me, the, the tuning in is as simple as if you can just imagine what it's like turning a radio dial, it's just an iota and the other transmission is present. Yeah. And so when I asked them if I said it right, they said, not really. Did I express this well? Not really. So then they gave their version of it. And that's often how it goes. And their version is always, you know, more accurate than what I might offer. I'm curious, like, because as you were sharing, I kept hearing the words of myself. It felt more like, um, it felt like a coming home when you say in, in that description of this going beyond the small self. Yeah. Um, and I'm always curious, and I wonder if the guides have spoken about this or they're in within your books, but the fact that we are in this illusion of separation. Mm -hmm. And I do wonder why that is. Why do we as humanity need to be going through these, this collective pain when coming in that we already feel the connection? We, 
I mean, I don't know. I What I understand about this is we've chosen it, we claim it, but also when you're born, it's like you're born into a, a field that has already been polluted by fear. And it's so present that we just assume it's supposed to be there. And, the, and it's not true. The guides say the action of fear is to claim more fools. The action of fear is to claim more fear. It's like, you know, jumping into a swimming pool where somebody peed. You don't know it, but that's what you're used to, you know? And that's not it. That's not it. So, you know, we, I understand, if I'm right with this, yes. And I get yes. You know, we stopped believing that source or the source of all things was present or would meet our needs in ways that were essential. And when you do that, you start hoarding your food or you build a wall up to keep your neighbors out from getting yours. And then you pick up a rock and then you pick up a gun and then you pick up a bomb to ensure you're going to get what you're supposed to have or you think you're supposed to have. And the guides say, you know, these things are our creations. We created walls and borders. We created all these things. These are our creations. We're accountable and responsible individually and collectively to our own creations. What we don't understand, which is interesting, is that we're all in vibrational accord with them. In other words, if I say, look at that terrible thing over there, I've just aligned to that thing and as terrible which is a level of co-resonance. I've decided what the thing is, and I've called myself to its energetic equivalency, which means I, you know, they say who you put in darkness, what you put in darkness calls you to the darkness. It's that simple. So we're contributing to all these structures of this world because it's what we see. And if the level of consciousness that we hold doesn't lift to claim a new possibility, likelihood we're just going to keep getting what we've had which is not going so well right now. Or maybe it's going perfectly well and we just are seeing it through our design or what we think it should look like because we're seeing radical change on all fronts. So if we keep highlighting the obvious and pointing out all the things that we don't like about the world, we just continue to perpetuate what's already well, You there. can see something to see that it needs to be changed. It's not whitewashing and it's not spiritual bypassing. Mm -hmm. But to see something and to re-see it from a higher level of awareness is to give it the potential to change. Nothing is changed until it's first seen as a possibility. Nothing. And if we are intractable in our beliefs of how the world should be based on what it has been and just try to keep repairing the leaky roof that might need to be replaced with a whole other idea of what a roof can be, you know, we, we, we're going to have basically what we've had so i i don't know what i was saying it's um i think this is all potentially opportunity but when the guide the, the book the book the guides just finished is called a world made new and it's really about this process see when they when they say what you damn damns you back they also say what you bless blesses you in return and a blessing they say isn't like what you hear after another mass shooting in the U.S., prayers and blessings for, you know, which is just a platitude. But they say that a blessing is realizing, knowing the presence of the divine where it has been denied. And they say that does alter things. You are bringing the light where the darkness has claimed stead. And that doesn't mean you're fixing things. It's not about getting people to behave the way you think they should because that's still operating from a kind of bias. Some of this is letting God be God, but that doesn't work unless you trust that that is actually an active principle or that source is power. You know, the guides say, we're, there's, they say there is one note song in the universe and everything is an expression of that one note song. It's God is all things. The tree is your fingertips as the stars as the body on the battlefield, as the newborn, it's all source in vibration in different ways that's been named and claimed in manifest ways. And to re-know things back to source, to reclaim them as of source, is actually to, to let God be God, to re-know the universe as spirit. Yeah, fascinating. It's... Um, <clears throat> It can be challenging if we're living in fear, though, isn't it, to, to really yeah. embrace that concept? 
totally lean into that. Yeah. And my whole life was in fear. It's less, it's less than it was. It's still, it's still mm-hmm. there, but it's not what it was. But I was the kid that was afraid to go to gym class. You know, I, I was terrified. Name it, I was scared of it. So, you know, it's who I was. And I'm not that way anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Do they talk about then, like, because we, we're coming into the, like you said, the 12th book is, is, is put down on paper. <laughs> but th- through this, where it feels like humanity is at a crossroads. Yeah. And, Obviously, they're not predicting the future, and it's up down to us at the end of the day because we have free will. But I, from what you see, are you optimistic? Are you unsure? What, the guys are you? optimistic. Okay. I'm unsure some days, mm-hmm. really. But I think that this can be seen as opportunity and must be seen. And if I'm to trust the guys, and I do, we're going to make it. And that it may not be comfortable at all. You know, a lot of things I think may collapse. Structures that we decided should always be there may not always be there and perhaps something higher or better. You know, this is what the guide said, and this was in the first book. I am the word dictated in 2009. They said, humanity is at a time of reckoning and a reckoning is a facing of oneself and all of one's creations. And they said that everything that's been created in fear is going to need to be recreated in a higher way. And that would include commerce and government and education and all these structures, you know, that have been informed by fear. They said, you know, they said there's nothing wrong with a bank. The idea of a bank is fine. They said like the first bank was when somebody asked to hold somebody else's stuff when they went hunting in the forest. That was the bank and the banker, you know, nothing wrong with it. It's what we've done with it. Nothing wrong with government, what we've done with it. You know, how, it, nothing wrong with religion, but, you know, we've done a lot of messy things in the name of religion, and religion has become, you know, politicized in, in other ways. I think that perhaps to have very little to do with the initial message of truth that I believe is at the heart of all religion. Yeah. And then the mess that, or the, the turmoil that we see in then ultimately, is like you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that unless something is brought to light, so we see if what it is to yeah. be aired, yeah, then yep. we will never go beyond that. Well, that's what I understand. You know, okay. um, they've said it this way: if you've got a body buried in the basement, eventually it's going to stink up the whole house. And we're in a stinky house, and we got to bury. We got to look at what we've been stuffing down you know there's always been racism and bigotry and there's always been you know violence and greed and all of these things you know that are an act upon which the guides say is they're all masks that fear wears they all have a basis there and so we get to see these things and then we get to choose other you know yeah beautiful just as we're wrapping up the podcast paul um, I am curious if you, uh, I, I don't know, like with the lab, no 12 books. Yeah. And if you were to distill an overall message mm-hmm. that, that has come through that the guides have wanted us to take on board, yeah, what would it be? I mean, I would say, I think just now, cause what I get is that the divine self has come as you, as you. And its expression through you is what alters the world. It's what changes everything. That's what I think they're teaching. And they're teaching that in a way that we can manage and hold it without sort of blowing our minds open to the level where we can't show up for work. You know, I mean, they, 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 they're really, they've really given us this stuff in the stages that we can acclimate to. I've heard of people who read seven books in, a, in, in five, five weeks and they go, you know, they go, bad. it's too much to take in. I couldn't do it. I can barely get through one of them. They're not like beach books. They're not fun reads. They're, they're, they're fascinating, but they're, yeah. they're challenging and they're transmissions that are energetic. So I think that's the message. Yeah, beautiful. And w- what's next for you, Paul? Like you're, you're in your rainforest now? In, in the rainforest now. 
Um, workshops, events? I'm doing workshops. I go to, I leave on Monday and then I'm going to be in Costa Rica again, channeling. And um, I'm back touring, which I wasn't doing for a few years, but I'm enjoying that. And I'm going to tell my own story. I've been, I'm supposed to write a memoir of my, my tales. And I've been avoiding that because I haven't done my own writing since the channel book started. And I used to have terrible, terrible, terrible writer's block, the worst of anybody I've ever met. And the fact that these books are dictated with no editing has just been ironic, beyond ironic for me. So I have to go back and try to do my own work again. And I'm a little nervous, but that's next. And that's it. That's exciting. It is. It's ex really exciting. Yeah. yeah. Will, will we ever see you in Australia, mate? You know, I have a psychic that I see every, I see him at once every year, year and a half. And for the last four years, he's been saying, have you worked in Australia yet? Because you're going to be working in Australia a lot. And I go, well, nobody's asked me yet. So I'd love to. So hopefully one day I will, because this guy is like all for it. So I'm, I'm like, okay, uh, well, maybe we can all make that happen for you, mate. Right. That's for sure. Thank you. It's definitely, it's definitely a momentum over here. That's Good. that's definitely happening. Yeah. Look, Paul, um, last qu last thing for you. Where can I send people? Obviously, the, your books are on Audible. They're available. Yeah. Website. Audible, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any of the booksellers you can find. Um, and my website's just my name, paulselig.com. I do a lot of online teaching. Wednesday nights, there's a live stream. Wednesday nights, U.S. time. I don't know what time that is in Australia. But we record everything and send transcripts. So when people are actually joining from all over the world, so it's, you know, yeah. and a five day intensive every month, we have that as well. So the guides are oh, teaching wow. us form. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You do keep yourself busy then. Are you, uh, are you doing readings as well still one on one? I do. Like yeah. That? Not as much as I used to, but I like mm -hmm. doing the readings because I like, cause they're, they're provable. You can, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I don't talk to dead people. And I don't like telling the future, but like if you're estranged from your best friend and you give me your best friend's name, I can tune into him like the radio that I am and hear him and hopefully broker some support for changing things. So I do a lot of that kind of work. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good on you. Well, thanks, Paul. I, I really appreciate it. It was lovely to reconnect, mate. And uh, I appreciate you. your time and, and everything My that you do. And, and happy, happy, happy on the new, on the new addition to your family. Yes, I'm very excited. I'm looking forward to welcoming him any day now, any day. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Take care.